Good evening. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater, home of public programs at the UCLA Film and Television Archive. My name is Mei Hong Ha Zung, and I am the director of the archive. Welcome to the restoration world premiere of We're Alive. Before we begin, as a land-grant institution, the Film and Television Archive would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. We are humbled to do work in this community. The story behind a restoration sometimes begins with a basic question. Do you have this film? And for archivists dedicated to preserving and making accessible moving images, this question can sometimes pose a challenge, invoking a sense of responsibility. This journey began for the UCLA Film and Television Archive in 2016, when scholars approached the Archive Research and Study Center seeking a 1974 student documentary made at UCLA about women in prison. Here's what we know. The film, We're Alive, was credited to the video workshop of the California Institution for Women, otherwise known as CIW, and the Women's Film Workshop at UCLA. Though little was known of the filmmakers, the knowledge of its existence as an important feminist film brought researchers to our door asking for more information. Unfortunately, we had no element for We're Alive at UCLA, but we knew whom to ask. UCLA found two prints at the British Film Institute, and with their cooperation, we had the film scanned and made accessible for the researchers. Still, the film's mystery continued. When I joined the archive in 2021 as director, I learned more about the film and asked the archive team to see if we could locate the filmmakers. We were more like we we knew that finding them would actually help us learn more about the production, but also potentially could lead us to better elements to restore the film. We checked the university archives and our colleagues at the School for Theater, Film, and Television to see if we could learn more about the workshop. No information was found. And so, having essentially given up on finding the filmmakers, we decided to move forward and begin conversations, planning a program with the Center for the Study of Women to connect the film and prison conditions in the 1970s with current realities facing prisoners today. A few months later, at the UCLA Film and Television Archives Festival of Preservation last year, at a serendipitous dinner that will live in infamy, um, the archive's television curator, Mark Quigley, I believe, so was sitting next to uh, a woman named Kathy Levitt. As luck would have it, Kathy shared that she once made a student film about women in prison. The film was We're Alive. We were floored. Tonight, Kathy and her partners on this project will share their story of making the film and in a Q&A afterward, we will be joined on stage by members of CCWP, the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Of course, before the conversation, we will present the restoration world premiere of the 49-minute documentary. After meeting the filmmakers, we learned that the original video and film preprint elements for We're Alive were sadly lost over the years. Thankfully, Kathy Levitt held some prints for the film, and we utilized two of them, along with the scans from two prints at the BFI, to stitch together the restored 4K element you will see here tonight. We Are Live consists of opening and closing sequences shot on 16 millimeter color film, but the majority of the film was shot on black and white port a pack video within the correctional facility. Digital restoration tools were utilized to fix or alleviate video artifacts in the port pack shots. And we also sharpened the image and removed most of the built-in wear and dust um, and damage throughout the film. Although you may notice some very uh, stubborn scratches um, in the film. UCLA would like to acknowledge the digital lab for the initial scan and thank the team at Illuminate Hollywood for the additional scans and 4K color correction and restoration, as well as Endpoint Audio for the audio restoration. We'd also like to thank the filmmakers, 
Mickey Gleason, Kathy Levitt, and Chris Mahana Lesiak. Kathy Levitt and her husband, editor John Carnahan, were instrumental in the restoration, coming to the color, timing, and audio sessions and giving their feedback and expertise. The screening would not be possible without the work of so many archive staff, including Mark Quigley, Todd Weiner, our motion picture curator, and our head of the Archive Research and Study Center, Maya Montaigne Smuckler, all collaborators on this journey to find the filmmakers. Also, also crucial to tonight's screening are Randy Antak in our digital lab and Jillian Borders, our head of preservation. So to answer the question posed to us in 2016, do you have this film? We do, and after years of work, you get to see it tonight. I want to also thank the scholars, Beth Capper and Rox Samer, who brought the film to our attention. And you could read some of their writing about the film on the archives blog at cinema.ucla.edu. The blog also features reflections from CCWP members Robbie Hall and Doris Rolden, who served for decades at CIW, where the film was uh, made. Um, finally, I want to thank our colleagues at the British Film Institute, our community collaborators, CCWP, the School of Theater, Film, and Television, our excellent staff in programming and projection, marketing, and communications, the anonymous donor who's made the archive screenings at the Wilder Free, and our partners at the Hammer. And finally, our collaborator and partner in the program, the Center for the Study of Women. So before we bring the filmmakers on stage to introduce the film, we're joined by Grace Kung Wan Hong, the director of the study for, for the Center for the Study of Women and the Streisand Center at UCLA. She is jointly appointed in the departments of Asian American Studies and Gender Studies, where she teaches courses on women of color feminism, Asian American culture and history, and racial capitalism and neoliberalism. Please join me in welcoming Grace to the stage. Uh, thank you, May. Uh, so my name is Grace Kyung Wan Hong, um, and as May said, I am the director of the Center for the Study of Women and the Streisand Center at UCLA. Uh, CSW works toward a world in which education and scholarship are tools for social justice feminism improving the lives of people of all genders. In concert with the Streisand Center, which is dedicated to finding forward-looking solutions to the most pressing social issues of the day, we are delighted to partner with the Film and Television Archive on tonight's very important event. So I would like to make a special acknowledgement of our community partner, the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, for over 25 years, CCWP has been reaching across prison walls to challenge the abusive conditions inside California's prisons and to fight for the release of women and transgender incarcerated people. After the screening, uh, we will hear from two formerly incarcerated organizers with CCWP, Susan Bustamante and Romerilyn Ralston, as a part of a panel with the filmmakers. The panel will be moderated by CSW Streisand Center's uh, Deputy Director of Community Research and Policy, Colby Lenz. Um, we also, uh, we're also very happy to welcome several CCWP organizers, uh, many formerly incarcerated, as a part of our audience today. Woohoo! And uh, so with that, I will um, turn it back over to May to introduce tonight's filmmakers. Check out Grace's heels if you get a chance. They're pretty amazing. Okay, well, um, first off, thank you so much, Grace, and it's been such a pleasure working with you and also Colby on this program. So um, I have the honor of introducing the filmmakers and producers for We're Alive. Each is an accomplished woman in their own right, and so I'll call them up, and you'll get to hear from them shortly. An accomplished writer, director of dramatic features, filmed in Paris, France, Dakar, 
Senegal, Amsterdam, and the American South. Her current project will take her back to the American South to direct her adaptation of William Faulkner's World War II novel, Soldier's Pay. A writer for film and television based in LA, welcome Mickey Gleason. You can come up and wait here. And Okay, great. Emmy-nominated Peabody Award-winning television producer. She specializes in historical stories. Over the past 30 years, her documentaries have been broadcast on American Experience, American Masters, on PBS Prime Time. Her most recent production, Beyond the Baton, a biography of maestro Thomas Wilkins, the first African-American to conduct the Boston Symphony, premiered in PBS in November 2021. We're joined by Christine Mahana Lesiek. As a student at UC Berkeley in the late 60s and early 70s, she became politically active. The MFA program at UCLA allowed her to expand her interests in prison reform, including when making the film We Are Alive. An archival producer on a wide variety of projects from PBS documentaries to the television series Ripley's Believe It or Not, and even early reality television, we are joined by Kathy Levitt. Please join me in welcoming Mickey Gleason, Christine Mahana Alessiak, and Kathy Levitt on the stage. Yeah, we decided to all come up together because we don't have too much to say. We wanted to keep it short. Um, you know, I've spent the last 40 plus years making documentary films, and many of them are about social justice. A lot of them have to do with Native American history. and. I don't think I would have taken that path if it hadn't been for these two women who stand here with me today. Um, it all began with this film you're seeing tonight because I was a graduate student at UCLA and I wanted to make art films and that was really the way to go back then. I mean, there was this underground film movement, um, real you know, black and white, strange, uh, wonderful films, really, that inspired me to want to be a filmmaker. But I hadn't really thought about documentaries and I hadn't thought about social justice until Kathy and, and Mickey suggested we go inside a women's prison and find out what those women were feeling and thinking. And so I said yes, and uh, you know, it changed my life. And that's the film you're going to see tonight. So, Mickey? Okay. <laughs> when uh, we were interviewed for the Daily Bruin, I was telling the reporter that we were UCLA graduate students at a very political time. And I remembered a group of us um, sort of discovering a bookstore in Hollywood called Progressive Books. Unfortunately, they were about to close the store and retire, but we had a few months of driving up there, buying books, and sitting in the back of the store talking to the owners and their friends. Um, there was a man who had been part of the Abe Lincoln Brigade in the Spanish Civil War. Um, there was a filmmaker who had been put out of business by the HUAC hearings. And there was a woman, I remember, who I think did some jail time for her part in organizing a concert with Paul Robeson. So I, at this time, had never heard of any of these things. Um, it was a remarkable education. And um, I, when this screening of We're Alive came together, it, I remembered that. It seems like a similar type of thing. When the UCLA Film Archives restores and preserves this kind of material, um, they're giving students today and students in the future um, a, great, a great chance, really, to see um, politically engaged women who are more or less your same age from half a century ago. So I think that's amazing. and. Um, UCLA Film Archives and Center for Women and Barbara Streisand Center, thank you very much.
We're Alive was first shown in 1974 at the US UCLA Film School screenings. We had all stayed up all night cutting in the final pieces for the next morning screening. The film was shot and recorded on half-inch black and white video porta pack and then transferred to film for editing. It was the only way the film could have been made at that time. Film and video technology has advanced tremendously, while at the same time conditions in CIW prison have only worsened. The film that you will see looks and sounds as good as it does because of Todd Weiner and Jillian Borders and her preservation team who gave new life to We're Alive. I'd like to say a special thank you to them and to May and everyone at the UCLA Film Archives, as well as Colby and Grace of the UCLA Center for the Study of Women, and to Susan and Romarilyn from the California Coalition for Women. We are grateful to all of you, but most especially to the women you will meet in the film today. Their words were powerful in 1974, and they continue to resonate today. The ded dedication of the film still holds. To all the women before, to all the women after, from the women now. And speaking of women who came before, happy birthday to my mother, who's sitting in the back row. Thank you very much. Our moderator tonight is Colby Lentz, Deputy Director of Policy and Community Research at the UCLA Center for the Study of Women, Streisand Center. Colby's commitment, community engaged, Colby's community engaged research, organizing, and policy advocacy addresses the intersections of criminalization, incarceration, and gender-based violence. Colby is a co-founder of Survived and Punished and an organizer with the California Coalition of Women Prisoners and the Transgender Advocacy Group. Thank you, Colby. Thank you, May. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to call our panelists up. So we're going to have the, our three filmmakers up on the stage again. And, and also, we're Marilyn Ralston and Susan Bustamante, who I'll introduce as they come up since they were not introduced yet. But maybe all of you can find your way now-ish. Um, <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here and for for watching this film. We're really excited to have this conversation uh, together. Um, as they come up, um, let's see. Uh, Romarilyn Ralston, who's wearing the Black Panther jacket, um, is the executive director of Project Rebound at CSU Fullerton, a student-centered program that supports the higher education. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> So Romarilyn's the ED at Project Rebound at CSU Fullerton, which is a student-centered program that supports the higher education and successful integration of formerly incarcerated people. Feel free to come on up. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Romarilyn identifies as a black feminist abolitionist, and she is especially focused on building power with systems impacted BIPOC women and other impacted people. She is a longtime member and organizer with CCWP and serves on the leadership committee. In 2022, Ralston, Romarilyn, received a full pardon from Governor Gavin Newsom. <laughs> and then Susan Bustamante, will you raise your hand? <laughs> Uh, was also granted executive clemency by former Governor Brown and released from CIW in 2018 after serving 31 years of a life without parole sentence. Susan was an original member of Convicted Women Against Abuse uh, at CIW, and she's a, a longtime member of CCWP from the inside, including as a leader in the campaign to drop LWAP, which is the campaign to drop life without parole sentencing in California. Susan is the reentry coach, currently with Home Free, which is a new reentry program for survivors of domestic violence who are coming home from prison after long terms. Yay. So welcome to both of you. <laughs> and welcome back to our filmmakers. Um, so we will start um, with a question to the filmmakers. We'll do a little bit of moving around um, up here and have some conversation. Uh, so. Thank you so much for your work on this film. It's amazing to see it in its restored form. Uh, the first question for you all is, you made this film while you were grad students at UCLA, 
And uh, how did you start the film workshop at CIW? What motivated you to do the work with, with women in prison? So if anybody wants to start, please feel free. I think that's a Kathy question. Or a question. <laughs> <laughs> and remember to use your mics. I, I'm, I'm just going to give some context to... Kathy, um, grab that mic on your... Oh, yes, the mic. Okay. <laughs> um, well, in 1971... I think it was August, George Jackson was killed at San Quentin. And then in September of that same year was the Attica uprising. So um, I had attended also trials for the San Quentin Six when, at, before I came to film school. And I, so I was aware of a lot of the issues related to prisons and prison reform. So when the opportunity came up to do a co-directed project that was community related, this was an idea that Mickey and I had and we asked Chris to join us to, to go into CIW. Amazing. <laughs> do either the other two of you want to chime in on that one? We went in uh, not really having an idea about how we were going to pull this off because we didn't have a vision for a film like the film you saw tonight. We wanted to get to know these women, but we wanted to bring their stories out into the world. And that didn't seem to be possible. We weren't even allowed to take photographs. So we came up with the idea of teaching a video workshop, which they, at the prison, were very much in favor of. and. We, instead of erasing the tapes, we kept them <laughs> and edited them Oops. into a film. <laughs> and I'm glad we did. Yeah, okay. And, and why was anonymity so important to the project? Because it really wasn't about us. I mean, it would be easy to start crowing and saying, look at what we did, but we didn't feel that way. I mean, it was really... A conversation you could see they were driving the story we were just there with we showed them how to use this porta pack with this reel to reel you had to you had to thread the thing and if you threaded it wrong it would it would destroy it <laughs> and we showed them how to you know get a focused picture and we we were we were teaching the workshop so that they would see what we were doing we didn't think that they were going to leave the prison and become filmmakers, although that was possible. But we wanted them to be a part of it, and we didn't want to be the star or the filmmakers up there like we're sitting now. And that's why I'm glad we're not the only ones. And that's why we, we were anonymous. You know, we were trying to submerge our egos, I think. And we didn't want any repercussions from the authorities. That, <laughs> that too. <laughs> Right, right. And did you also want to make it a challenge for the archive to figure out who made this film on the outside? <laughs> I, I just want to say, at that time, we could never, ever have imagined this happening. Ever. Not, I mean, the, f the film was useful for, you know, and, and, and it was used, but we never thought about preservation. Mm -hmm. And what, what, if anything, would you say you learned from the participants in the film that you've carried with you? That comment, when she says, I really wonder who is in prison. You know, there was sisterhood, and I would like you two to talk about that. Prison's not any place anybody wants to go, but we really felt strongly that there was a feeling of, of a community, and not everybody was part of that, but the women in this film were, of sisterhood, of caring about one another, that doesn't exist in the outside world that's so fragmented and even more so today. So who's really in prison? You know, that question just leaped out at me. Yeah, and I love hearing their voices. I mean, to me, it's the spirit of oral poetry coming, you know, the story at that time. And when I first saw it again after all these years, the first thought is, wow, this is still so relevant. And, you know, like poetry, it's, it's being told with different language now. But the story's the same. We're still pushing the same rock 
up the hill. But what I love about that expression in We're Alive is I think the intimacy is what stands out for me. And that's, and that's the result of, of our weekly um, consciousness raising groups in that 70s feminist tradition. Um, we got very close and we were all pretty much the same age and so there was the optimism and the hope of youth before you've hit the outside world and all of that stuff. Um, so I, f I find it very beautiful as a moment and an inspiration. Thank you so much. Kathy, do you want to chime in on that one? Or? Yeah, no, I think um, the women and their voices have stayed with me all these years. You know, they've, they've really, um, they're still there, you know. It was very powerful. And um, I think we all learned a lot both ways. I mean, it was a, um, a learning experience, a communication. And then uh, one last question for the moment for the three of you before we turn more to Romero, Lynn, and Susan. Um, we tried collectively to, to locate some of the participants of the film, those who are still living, um, but we're not able to make any of those connections. Is there anything you're comfortable sharing about um, anything you know about uh, what happened with the participants? Well, one of the characters that is so engaging in the film, uh, Francis Simpson, the one who uh, loves being in prison because she gets to have all these girlfriends. Uh, she uh, became our friend. She left prison and hung out with us for a while and became a very good friend of mine and actually ended up going to school to become an engineer. Cal Poly Pomona graduated with an engineering degree and went to work uh, for a government program that helped design the Stinger missile and was very, very happy employed as an engineer, unfortunately, as a male engineer, because Frances did not pass as a woman. And whenever she would go into a women's restroom, women would freak out. So she just took the path of least resistance and was hired as a man. Unfortunately, people started getting suspicious, and I don't know if her boss looked at some of her records or whatever, but she was she was let go and became homeless, and, and a lot of bad things happened. But uh, she eventually got an apartment in Novato through the Section 8 and, you know, lived until 2011 died of emphysema, you could see them all smoking like, like chimneys. So, but it was a, you know, success story that turned the other way, not because of Francis, but because of the rest of the world. Yeah, really sorry to hear that. Um, is it okay if we turn here a bit? Okay, great. Uh, so, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Romero Lynn and Susan are great leaders in our world in the social movement to uh, expose prison conditions and, and create new systems. <laughs> um, and I know you were part of a pre-screening with some other formerly incarcerated women um, who've been, who served long terms, you know, only one back into the 70s. Um, but what, what of the film Were Alive resonated with you in your experience of, at CIW? Um, was there anything that stood out as different? Anything, I know there's a lot of material there, but anything you want to speak to? I'm going to speak on when they were talking about the pay and the no pay and the pennies for pay. It's still the same. The um, parole money is still the same. And that was 50 years ago. So nothing's changed as far as that's concerned. The, uh, oh, there's so much that's even gotten worse through time, but I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn for a minute. Thank you, Kobe, for that question. First, I just want to thank everyone for the filmmakers, for, for making this film, for, for thinking about women in prison in the first place, which most people don't even think about us. You know, we are either a, a forgotten population or, you know, we're just invisible. So thank you so much for, for making this film and, and bringing it to the world. 
and to to UCLA for for having it uh, shown here tonight. Uh, so many things resonated about the film, um, but I think most importantly for me was how the women articulated themselves in the film. You know, they were able to talk about their lives and really expose the conditions of their lives, their addictions, their struggles. Um, but they did it in a way that, that really felt like they not only own their lives, but they were very aware of the conditions within society that created the pathway to prison for them. And there was one piece that really struck me uh, as so important for these women when one woman spoke about togetherness, you know, caring collectively, which is the CCWP motto that we create community inside. You know, there's a shared experience among incarcerated people and people with an incarceration experience that brings people together. And the women in this film displayed that, I mean, beautifully. And not just their intimate conversations with you, but their closeness in the room. You know, the things that they shared about themselves and each other were, were so intimate that, and they were incarcerated. You know, the, sh the shame of their incarceration and the stigma just didn't resonate with me. It didn't come through in this film. And that's what I really loved about what they were saying, how you presented them. It wasn't the society view of incarceration and people who become incarcerated you know, and what it is that got us to incarceration. They spoke so well about the problems with, with poverty, with, with substance abuse, with racism, and, and the courts, and all the, the things that get people to prison, the things that currently exist, you know, the work that many of us within CCWP work to dismantle and disrupt um, those things were really important to me about this film, and it's still present today, you know, with the women who are currently incarcerated. You know, Susan did over 30 years. I did over 20 years myself. There's women in this audience sitting right next to some of you that serve more time than you've been alive, and they've survived a place like CIW. All of us were there. The, the sweatshop of a sewing factory and, you know, what that does to the psyche, you know, and how that, you know, frames a person's existence. You know, we know that we're more than those jobs. And they talked about that. I don't want to be a janitor. I don't want to be a cook. I don't want to be a seamstress. I don't want to do nails. I don't want to do hair. There's other things that I can do. And there's other things that I have done. But the carceral state, the prison system, you know, relegates people into these really menial types of professions and, and jobs, and then they pay you pennies on the hour if you get paid at all. They don't value education. They don't value, you know, the experiences and the skills that you come into prison with. You know, you're put into a box. And the system, the, the, the correctional system, tries to nail you in that box and keep you in that box for as long as they can to the point where even when you parole, you still feel like you're in a box. And so it's, it's that kind of um, problems that I think the women were facing then, and they articulated well that women still face today. And I think Susan and I both, because we were there at the same time together. When I arrived at CIW, Susan was there. And it was still some of the same stuff. Um, I've said enough. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Susan, you want to? Yeah, I'm going to add a little bit more. Um, when we were there in the, uh, when let's say I got there in 87, so in the 90s, um, 
we had an okay warden. We had an okay, we had the yard. We had, it was open that we could uh, get together. We can, we we formed family. We formed caring. We formed that we can lean on each other. When somebody in our family died or there was a birth or whatever, whatever, a birthday, you know, people made you feel special. And today, the way that, that CIW runs, they're isolating them. And the women have been there decades, decades. over. There's a couple of them that have been there over 52 years. You know, there's many of them that have done get past 30, almost into 40 years. So then you come out into society that you're not prepared to come out to. And so you're floundering, you're scared, but yet we know that we have people that we can lean on because somebody understands what we're going through. But inside, you, you're you hopeless. You just think that there's no way out. We For a while, there was a couple of governors that said, you know, lifers aren't leaving except in pine boxes. Can you imagine what that makes you feel like? Because no matter what, everybody was a life without. Everybody, because nobody was getting dates. And so, but yet you have to get up, you have to function, you have to program, you have to, it's like you're robots. And they're, you're at their mercy. Whatever their day is, when they pick up those keys, is what your day is like. So if they had a fight at home, or if they felt worthless, or whatever the heck they feel at home, they're bringing it to you, and they're going to torture you. So they feel that they can punish you because they're carrying the keys, and you did something bad. Okay. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, that is a, a good tie-in to our next little piece, which is that we're going to show a very short uh, video while we stay up on stage and then continue this conversation um, after we see it. Um, and it's a three-ish minute video that Chisa Hughes, who's also here with us today. Um, Chisa. Yay, yay. Chisa. <laughs> uh, Chisa is a filmmaker uh, from the Bay Area who also was a volunteer organizer with CCWP in LA. Um, and this video is to help kind of bring... Uh, to bring some of the current issues of what's happening at CIW, where the prison, where where Alive was filmed, um, and in prisons across the state, uh, to um, just kind of help us all understand what's been happening more recently at CIW, um, and then we'll continue the conversation up here. So hopefully we won't be blocking anybody's view. Um, but now we'll watch this very short video. Thank you, Chisa. Thank you again to Chisa and to all the organizers doing the work to to. Demand change. Um, so uh, one more specific to Marilyn and Susan, which is um, why is it so important for you to do this activism work? Uh, both of you were involved while you were incarcerated, and you've brought that out here to the streets. Um, if there's anything you want to say about that? I just want to say, you know, because it hasn't changed, because they're using the keeping you in for decades and decades just as job security, for all these prisons and for an excuse to uh, scare society. Ooh, if we let them out, they're going to come hurt. You know, uh, since 2017 that they started uh, commuting LWAPs, so far we have a little over 200 people that had the life without sentence that are out now. Zero recidivism. So nobody's committing crime. They're not the worst of the worst. Everybody deserves a second chance. And this is what we're going to fight for. Not only are we going to fight for dropping now up, but we're going to fight for closing these prisons because uh, just to keep people job securities, go, go to McDonald's. Okay. <laughs> Hard act to follow there. <laughs> Yeah, I think you said it perfectly, Susan. Um, you know, I, I do this work because prisons still exist. You know, people are being harmed every day by the prison system. They're being harmed every day by fear. Um, women are being incarcerated and taken away from their families, their children, their communities. And it's really not necessary. You know, in the film the women started to talk about alternatives to prison. There has to be alternatives to prison. Prison should not exist. It's, it's not a necessary institution that needs to be a part of our society. We can think of something else. It doesn't have to be prison. Now, 
Susan mentioned the recidivism rate. You know, and here in California, it's, it's around 49% or higher every year, and it's been that way for decades. We spend billions and billions of dollars on corrections when half the people return to incarceration because they're homeless, they have mental health issues, they have health care issues. We need to spend those billions of dollars in the community taking care of our community members instead of incarcerating them and causing more harm and separating families. The prison system is not a place for healing or for care. You don't get care in prison. You can build community there, though. And we saw it in your film. I can see it in this room. I experienced it in the prison. So we do do that. But it was I did not survive that place because of the rehabilitative methods of the corrections department. I survived 23 years of prison because of this lady right here and some of you in the audience and some of those women who are still in prison. They cared for me and they helped me heal. Prisons don't do that. Individuals do that. So there's no reason to have barbed wire, electric fences, and people getting murdered inside a prison and sterilized, because we didn't talk about that, mm -hmm. you know, and committing suicide. That's not what we should be doing to our community members. And that's why I do this work. I think we can do better, and we, we must do better, and we must hold our government accountable to do better. What I wanted to say real quick is that over 80% of women that go to prison are domestic violence survivors, sex trafficked, forced into their crime because of their partners. And so then you go to a, a carceral system that, again, abuses you. So what kind of healing do you get? Because there's very few groups that are held inside of the prisons even though they say, ooh, we have this and we have that. No, you, you have to be on a waiting list. And if you're an LWAP, life without, sometimes you don't just, you don't get to go because they don't deem you going anywhere. So you don't even need to participate. But yet they're the ones who they turn to, to lead a group, to, to um, be a mentor, to run the prison, whatever. But it, it is just, and, and today, in, in today's time, where we had the, the family unity, they're isolating them, and they're, tra they're traumatizing the elder people. They've taken away, like CIW took away the honor dorm, which at least gave the elderly and the people who were, wanted to do, you know, heal and do good by themselves, by, you know, right by themselves, they took the honor cottage away, which means that anybody could be your roommate and if you don't agree with who your roommate is they'll move you and they throw you away from your support system and they are not even letting them interact i mean it is they are isolating i would not be surprised if there are more suicides coming up because it it's just that mentally bad right now because i was just in there on december 10th and the look on their faces where they're just, their their eyes are just like, I'm giving up, I'm tired. I'm like, don't do that. Yeah. Thank you both so much. Um, one more question for the for the whole crew here, and then we'll open up to audience questions and answers. Um, the question is, as we can see today, a film's restoration can bring new life and new audiences um, to a film. Uh, how how do you all think that this film and the rest its restoration might help change the conversation, um, change what's possible in terms of uh, changing closing the system? Yeah, and closing women's prisons and closing all prisons. Thank you. <laughs> that's a hard. That, well, that's it, hard. It like shows. Fifty years later. It, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, it, it's really difficult because. Uh, I think when we did this film, we th we had hopes that things were going to get better and that the film was used in education and criminology, sociology, and law classes that, um, that, that it would help change things. But that hasn't happened. Mickey, I saw you were going to... Yeah, I was just going to say the history um, 
the fact of seeing history and that there have been people before and that there's this long story of that helps you realize that, you know, that's a human condition, keeping at it. But, but it's not just starting now. I think that's very powerful to see people, young people, mm -hmm. 50 years ago. Well, one thing I feel about the, the articulateness of many of the women in there was that prior to us coming in, the Santa Cruz Women's Workshops were there. And I think those educational opportunities that those women had made a big difference for them. Um, and it's really terrible to hear how, limit, how, what, how the limitations have increased. Yeah, that's right. So that is a historical political education set of workshops that were happening by UC Santa Cruz um, students mostly and some faculty coming into CIW around the same time. Law and law, law students. students. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll move to, to audience Q&A in a minute, but do either of you? Yeah, I just wanted to say that now we have evidence. You know, we have, <laughs> we, we have a story. You know, we, we have those words from... 50 years ago, we have the words of people like Susan, myself, and others that can, you know, share their stories and, and you know, talk about, you know, how conditions were and still are. Mm -hmm. But but I think also, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to look at this film and say, you know, what was dangerous about these women? When you looked at them on film, they, they look like you. We look like you. You know, we're not the boogeyman or the, the monster that, you know, society sometimes and stereotypes us to be, you know, and, you know, other filmmakers who make these horror films about people. You know, I, th I think that's, that's the I beautiful say, part about your film. Yeah, I would say that when we screened it in the years after we made it, that was always the first comment by people. Those are prisoners? What yeah. are they doing in prison? You don't know we're prisoners until you put us in prison clothes. <laughs> you know, you don't know that. I can put you in an orange jumpsuit or stencil CDCR on the back of your jacket and then you become a prisoner. Exactly, exactly. And that's what's, that's what's so beautiful about your film. At a time when you made it, personal clothing was allowed. And so you got to see the expression and the identity mm -hmm. of individuals as they truly are, mm -hmm. their authentic self, even though they're incarcerated. Now they dress the women like men. The, your baggy pants and your, your shirts are, don't fit. Everything is baggy so that you look like a, um, look like a man then they wonder why you don't want to wear their stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Back to you, Kobe. <laughs> what does a man look like? Who knows? Okay. Um, so um, we're going to turn to the, the audience now for Q&A. Uh, we have some people with microphones that can help make sure we can hear you. Um, so if, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will get to you. Okay. I see a couple of hands. Um, I assume there are some people with mics. I don't see those people. There's <laughs> one phone. Okay, okay. <laughs> sure, yeah. Right there is great, and then we'll go over to the back. Uh, right? Perhaps you can expand upon this a little bit more, but did it become visible, or were any of you aware of how much more the prison system became an industry? Thank you so much. Would you repeat that question for us? I mean, Colby, if you heard yeah. it, repeat it. Yeah. Um, did it become visible? Let me know if I got it right. <laughs> um, or were you aware that the prison system became more of an industry? Um, over the years? Over the years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the woman in the film said it really, uh, you know, she said, you know, we're paying our oppressors. You know, we, yeah. we are sewing uniforms and, and making equipment, you know, by 
the box by the truckload, actually, and it's getting shipped out and sold to universities across the state and to offices and businesses across the state. Yeah, exactly. You know, the prison system is a labor system. It, it was a labor system when it was created. It was created to be a labor system. And so, yes, we know this. And we are paying our oppressors <laughs> when we are working for those pennies on the dollar to make furniture and uniforms and food products and all the other services and items that we make. You can find them online. There is a catalog, you know, <laughs> the Prison Industry Authority has a catalog. You can order things, and all of those things in that catalog are made by incarcerated people. And the thing is, too, is that they um, there is no sick days. There's no retirement. You work until you just cannot. That they actually, maybe if you're in your 80s, they let you bump it back to disabled. But you, you work, and if you're sick, you have to get up. If it's raining outside and the yard goes down, you're sitting in that puddle of, of, that, of rain and you're sick and you go to work. And if you have a kind enough boss, they can send you home. Or you sit there and you work because if not, they threaten you with a write-up and they will, they will write you, which would cost a lifer going to board three to five years. Or Just, ten. Yeah. Or ten now. Chris, you want to jump in? No, I'm just listening, you know. <laughs> just it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I did want to say just one yeah. thing that um, Kathy and I were, were having dinner and talking to both of you, and just the thing that amazed me was the stories about what it was like to get out and to try to adjust to society. So maybe some of the questions could be surrounding that. Because we can't ask these women in our film, uh, maybe Francis, but other than that, but you guys made that transition, so. Okay, thank you so much, Chris. We'll see if we have a bit of time or if it comes up in question. Yeah. But yeah, right at the back there. This was a great informative evening, but I'd hate to see it end here. Is there a plan for distribution of the film? I'd like to see all the people in, in the legislature locked in a room with the governor. <laughs> forced to watch this film and is it gonna can you sell it to Netflix or something like that I mean it really <laughs> needs to be seen thank you so much yeah, I like the the, yeah. the locked in a room piece let's see if we can make that happen <laughs> I agree that they need to see it and they need to understand that, you know, many of us um, up here work on policy and are trying to still change parole policy. You know, so many of the issues that come up in the film are so relevant today, unfortunately. Um, and I think seeing some of that historical arc may be impactful for some of the people who we need to change their minds and get their votes to be able to finally change um, some of this. But um, do you filmmakers want to speak to anything about distribution or? I don't know if you all heard that, but it's been entrusted to the UCLA archives. I think it's in good hands. All right. She said it. So. Yeah. So we have a, a question down front here by Patricia. I want to say something. Patricia, wait for the wait for the mic if you can, okay? It's coming. It's coming, it's coming. There you go. Yeah. Right. Um my name is Breezy. I was at CIW. Uh, I came to CIW in 2013 from CCWF. And when I was there going to chemo, uh, seven and a half hours every three weeks, the chains around my waist was, um, wasn't uh, tight enough because I was so skinny. Um, I had to put a, get a chrono, it taken a long time to get a chrono for a wheelchair because it was difficult to hold the chain around my waist and around my legs. So I finally got a, a wheelchair uh, from the doctor um, because they were so big. My waist was so tiny. I was so skinny. And um, they threatened to give me a write-up because the chains kept on falling down. 
and I finally got them. And um, they would said they would give me a, a write-up for escape if I continue mm -hmm. letting the chains fall down. And they finally gave me a wheelchair to uh, get chemo, you know, to walk with them. So I got the wheelchair to put in there, but um, it was difficult to walk with uh, chains, you know, and chains falling down. So, it's, you know, it is easy to get a write up. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I was getting seven and a half hours of chemo mm -hmm. at CIW going to Riverside Hospital. I was only 91 pounds. So Thank you. It was hard. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your survival, Patricia. Yeah. Thanks to CCWP for uh, yeah. Yeah. In the film, the woman said, "You know, this is about this is the prison is is punitive. That's what it's about. It's about punishment. It is not about care, medical care, healing, or protecting." You know, the, the public, it is about punishment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thank you for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. Do I see Doris raising a hand? Oh, and I'd like to ask a question. Here comes the mic, Doris. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I want to say I feel I've been out almost three years, I did almost four decades. Thanks to CC, <laughs> WP, WP, I'm free. Yeah. Yeah. And these women, and I, up, I have to differ. I think the system has changed for the worse. And that hurts me to say, and I'm not a negative person. And I get up and thank whatever's more than us, I don't care what you call it, every single day that I'm out of hell. I can't explain how I mean that. But all my sisters here understand that I mean it. But I have to ask this question. Why should the prison system, the whole judicial system, be any less of an hypocrisy than the whole government. Does anyone pay attention to what's going on now? It, it's just, it reminds me, I was born the year Hitler invaded Poland. And I, I, I mean, I was a baby, but as a young child, my father should rest in peace who was born in the Ukraine, oh, it's a whole big story, used to sit by the radio before families had televisions and we'd listen to what was going on. And he taught me, he took me to see films that the Nazis documentaries they made, they were proud of what they did and it's stamped in my head, young Nazi soldiers No, I know what I want to say. It upsets me. Threw up little Jewish babies, any babies that were different. Threw them up at there, and they caught them at the end of a bayonet. Ah. I was six years old when the world, when the war ended, and by seven years old, they, we went to see it at a Jewish center. We never went to anything connected with well doesn't matter. We went there, and I remember after 20 minutes, ugh, my father said, oh my God, we have to go. And I said, no, Daddy, I want to stay. I said, please. And that's what it seems to me our country's turning into. It, okay. I love this country, and it hurts me. And there's always been injustice and ignorance, and that's all that prejudice is, is ignorance. My father explained to me as a child. They bought their first home. This was in Detroit when Detroit was the place. I'm old. I'll be 84 on Wednesday. 
But then when I was born, that was the place. When I see documentaries on now, Detroit, it hurts me. What's going on now reminds me how Nazi Germany, people said, how come the Jews were so dumb they didn't leave? Because they never thought it could happen in their country. They were enlightened. When I see what's going on in this country, it terrifies me. Thank okay, you so much, it. Doris. Thank on. you, Doris. Yeah. As you all can hear, Doris is a deep thinker and also <laughs> somebody who has survived yeah. um, really intense oh, state yes. violence um, and it calls us to question uh, the state and, and what we're accepting and, and how much worse it is often than we know. Um, thank you so much, Doris. <laughs> no, no, no. And happy almost birthday. Um, Chisa. <laughs> Chisa, do you have a question? Yeah. And a mic? Or, okay. She's coming. I was going to ask if you would explain what Dreams Without Parole is for people. Sure. Here. I can, uh, Susan obviously can say more from direct experience, but I will just say that I think, yeah, one of the things that's striking about the film and part of why Chisa included um, a lot of the organizing around ending life without parole in the video is that at the time of the film, life without parole was not yet a sentence option in California. And um, that changed in the 70s and has really expanded in a, in a really terrible way. So it's, a, it's basically permanent incarceration. People call it death by incarceration, the other death penalty. Um, it's life in prison without the opportunity for parole. Um, in the last few years, as Susan said, there's been some clemency by the governors and some opportunities for some people who were sentenced to life without parole to come home. And many of those people are involved in the movement to, to end life without parole and all extreme sentencing. Um, so that is life without parole. So it's a, I think worse than life sentencing, um, but in the, in the realm of extreme sentencing. Do you want to say anything more? And yeah. Then we're going to wrap um, up. What I will say about life without is, um, you, you see these exit signs? Yeah. Life without, there are no exit signs. You go to the prison and you will die there because of the fact that there are no exit signs per that sentence. That's why we need to get abolish it. And it's you're just functioning every day. You, you, your mind is just like, why why do i even have to get up but then you want the boxes you want canteen you want the privileges that you earn by working so you get up and you go to work and life without is um they try to they tried to take your soul but we gathered and we rallied and we're fighting against it so we're not going to give them it <laughs> You want to close this out? Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the fam, we're alive. You know, I, it, it speaks for itself. And no matter what the state does, you know, we're alive. And I, I, I think your fam showed that, that you can be put in a cage, you can be put in a box, you can be put in prison, you can be put in all kinds of terrible situations and you're still alive. You know, there's, there's, there's something within us as human beings, you know, there's something about the human spirit that keeps us alive, even under the worst conditions and the worst situations, like what you just spoke about Doris, like what you had to endure as a, El Wap, what many of us have to endure in our lives, you know, there's something within us. And I think if we all take that special thing, you know, that human spirit that we have, and remember that the next person has it too, you know, I, I think we'd be in a better situation. We'll have a better community. We'll have a better society. We'll have a better world. And for all of you in this room, please take this film and the words of this film and the, the words of Susan and, and myself and just remember that when we're 
when when we sentence and we meaning all of us sentence people to incarceration we don't just remove them from our communities you know we we sentence people to death you know to societal death to a social death but we're alive and if we survive that we come home, 95% of all incarcerated people return to their communities. And when people come home, they need to have opportunities and they need to have support. So if you wanna do something, if you're too afraid to shut down a prison, and I hope you're not, because that's what we need to do, but if you are, there are organizations like CCWP, like Survived and Punished, and many others that will do that work for you. You know, please support those organizations so that we can stay alive. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to the filmmakers. Thanks to Susan and Marilyn. Um, talk to us if you want to get involved in any of the things you heard about tonight if you're not already. Thank you.